The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Antibody Drug Conjugates, The Ultimate Weapons Against Solid Tumors, Latest Progress, Future Possibilities, and Implications for Patient Care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash BUC860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here in person. There are so many of you and, and welcome to everyone online as well. Um, I am pleased to be here. We are putting on a program produced by Peerview Live called Antibody Drug Conjugates, the ultimate weapons against solid tumors, latest progress, future possibilities and implications for patient care. Um, I am Beth Sandy. I am a nurse practitioner in the Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, with me today, I have Jamie Carroll, who is a nurse practitioner as well at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I also have Elizabeth Prechtel Dumphy, who is a nurse practitioner in the Abramson Cancer Center at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center in Philadelphia, right up the street from me. So our goals for today are to augment your knowledge. I'm going to augment some knowledge today, guys. We are going to augment some knowledge um, of the structure and mechanism of action, efficacy and safety profiles involving antibody drug conjugates targeting HER2, HER3, and TROPE2 in solid tumors. Improve your skills in safely integrating current and emerging ADCs into treatment of patients with solid tumors. And then we're also going to enhance your ability to affect and manage adverse, effectively manage adverse events associated with these ADCs. All right, I'm going to start off by doing introduction to antibody drug conjugates, and I am by no means a pharmacist. I've heard PharmDs give excellent talks on this, but I'm going to Explain it in the best way I can understand. So there is your antigen up there on the left, and it's actually not part of that structure because that's part of the tumor. So antigens are present on tumors. Um, sometimes in certain different tumor types, they're a little more overexpressed than others. Um, but this is something that we definitely see on tumors and sometimes in normal tissue. Now, the actual structure of the antibody drug conjugate is there in the purple and the blue, and it basically has three specific components. One is the antibody, so that's the purple structure there, the Y-shaped antibody. It has a high affinity to um, target that antigen on the tumor cell, depending on what the target is. And again, we're going to talk about some of the different targets here today. Um, they generally have a long half-life. Um, and they can be either chimeric or humanized, such as other antibodies that we use. So that's the actual antibody. But then it has a drug or payload associated with it. That's going to be more of the, the actual active component that's going to go in and kill the cancer cell. But how do we get it there? Through the linker. So let's focus now on the linker. So the linker is going to be what connects the antibody, gets the payload through the door and into the tumor, so that the chemotherapy portion of this can kill the tumor. Um, linkers are termed as non-cleavable and cleavable. There's a little bit of a difference there, um, and we're going to talk about that too in an upcoming slide. And then the drug or the payload is the, usually the chemotherapy portion of it. Often it's a highly potent microtubule inhibitor, um, DNA damaging agents that hopefully are going to be more specific to the cancer cell because the antibody took it there as opposed to um, healthy tissue. Um, so again, it's amenable to that linker attachment, um, but we try to maximize it to the antibody and into the tumor as opposed to healthy tissues. So a little bit more looking at one of our targets, which is trope 2. So these are two drugs, um, sesetuzumab govotecan, and I'm, I'm going to try and say it, datapotamab, derextecan. So these are two that target trope 2. So you can see you've got your antibodies, you've got your linker, and then the payload here is going to be either the govotecan portion or the derextecan portion of um, either of these drugs, depending on which it is. But again, that's going to specifically target that trope 2 protein on the cancer cell. Sesetuzumab govotecan has several approvals, I believe. Um, the data one I don't think has any approvals yet, um, but it's certainly in clinical trials for several different tumors. Here's another um, antibody drug conjugate targeting HER2. Here's an uh, example of a couple of them here. Um, the first one that was around and approved was trastuzumab emtansine, or TDM1. Again, we're gonna, they're going to be targeting that HER2 receptor or antigen 
on the cell. Um, and you can see, again, there you have your linker. And then you have the mtansine, which is going to be the toxic payload to the tumor. Same on the other side. You have trastuzumab derixtecan, or TDXD, you'll hear us call it. Um, you have your monoclonal antibody. You have your linker. And then you have your payload, which is going to be um, the derixtecan portion of that. Um, and then we have another target. So at ADC, targeting HER3. So this is a new one in that HER family of receptors. Um, a drug that is looking at this is called patritumumab, Derextecan. So you see that Derextecan is that same uh, payload drug, but with a different antibody now. And this is targeting HER3. Um, it is, again, that an you see the three different things there. You see the antibody for HER3. You see the topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, which is Derextecan payload. And then you see a cleavable linker there. So when we talk about non-cleavable and cleavable linkers, so what I've looked at is that cleavable linkers tend to be a little more potent and they have something called a bystander effect. When that linker that is cleavable and it goes and helps the drug into the cell, it is so, I want to say potent or strong, that it has something called a bystander effect so that neighboring cells um, will also be affected by that payload. Now that's good and bad. Um, good because a lot of times there are cancer cells beside it and we want them to experience the cytotoxic effect. So that's good. The only bad thing would obviously be as if there were healthy cells in that bystander area as well. So this can work both ways. So again, just to review, the mechanism of action here is that on the left-hand side, that purple area, you see you have the antibody engagement that is going to lead into um, the linker that's going to help facilitate the payload, that membrane permeable payload to enter the cell and maybe on the right-hand side, you see their neighboring cells with that bystander effect, especially for one that has a cleavable linker. So here's an overview of approved drugs. Um, you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen, there are now six approved antibody drug conjugates, um, really, which have just come about in the past few years. So this is a really exciting and exploding field. Um, and then you have two on the right-hand side there that are investigational, again, across several different tumor types. And we're going to talk about some of those um, investigational uh, trials, looking at them uh, here today. Okay, so what about patients? How do we educate them about this? And, you know, this was a study um, put on by Longevity, and lung cancer is my background. Um, so I'm here kind of representing the lung cancer world um, with the ADCs. And they looked at patients, um, probably most of which had, had lung cancer, and said, you know, are you aware of what an antibody drug conjugate is? So um, I'm pretty sure that the 18% were lying that said they have really good familiarity with it because I'm like, wow, that's impressive. There must have been like 18%, you know, chemists or, you know, really specific pharmacokinetic type people there. That's pretty impressive. Um, the rest of them were either not familiar or somewhat familiar, like had heard of the term. And I think that's probably where most patients are with it. This is a bit high level, as we just kind of talked about, you know. So, you know, what patients really are going to want to know is, number one, what's the benefit? Why are you giving me this drug? And that's where we're going to talk about some of the data today um, to see, uh, you know, so we can be able to tell our patients what the benefits are. Um, we're going to talk about the side effects. Patients are going to want to know what the side effects are. We see like these new drug categories and we think, oh, antibody, that should be, you know, maybe less toxic. But this has a chemotherapy component and there are definitely chemotherapy type side effects that go along with this as well. Um, so you get a little bit of side effect of everything. Um, but we'll talk about those and what we can tell patients to expect. Um, they may ask, are there tests or biomarkers for patient selection? Sometimes there is. We'll talk about that as well because we saw that these are really targeted to those certain antigens. So I'll open this up to some of my colleagues. How do you explain ADCs to a patient in simple terms? I don't personally know that there is a lot of simplicity to this other than to say, literally, you have an antibody and a chemotherapy and then a linker that's going to help the chemotherapy get into hopefully just the tumor cell that we've targeted in order to kill it and help spare healthier tissue. Do you guys have any um, other ways of explaining it? I describe it to patients as sort of a chemo bomb, how it's the antibody and the chemotherapy delivering it directly to the cancer cell. Some, you get a little bystander effect, like Beth was saying. But in, in talks about how we explain this to our patients, I thought, 
well, many of our patients are well-read. They do their research. So I went to ChatGPT to see what they said on how to explain this to a patient. And what ChatGPT said is antibody drug conjugates are a type of targeted therapy. They consist of an antibody, which specifically binds to cancer cells, linked to a potent cytotoxic drug. This allows for precise delivery of the drug to the cancer cells, minimizing damage to healthy cells. So I give ChatGPT an A. I think that they did a nice job explaining it well that we could use to explain it to our patients in a way they could understand. They used cytotoxic, which I think is still too high level. But okay. Liz, any thoughts? So for my patients, I try to explain that it's a combined effect as well. You have the antibody and you have the chemotherapy together. And that by that linkage, we're able to give a higher dose of the chemotherapy than we might otherwise regular, by normal means that they may be experienced before if they were previously treated. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Jamie to talk about breast cancer. Hey, everybody. I'm Jamie Carroll. I'm going to be talking about HER2, HER3, and TROPE2 targeting ADCs in breast cancer. All right. So uh, in breast cancer, um, TDM1 or adotrastuzumab intancine was the first uh, antibody drug conjugate. This was approved in 2013 after the Amelia clinical trial. So if we all remember, Amelia was a randomized trial um, looking at patients who were HER2 positive um, and had previously been treated with trastuzumab and ataxane. And these patients were randomized to TDM1 or lapatinib plus capecitabine. So the efficacy results in this study, the median progression-free survival in the patients on the TDM1 arm um, was 9.6 months when you compare it to 6.4 months in, la in the lapatinib cape arm. The median overall survival at that second interim analysis did cross the stopping boundary for efficacy. So in compared those two arms, 30.9 months OS in TDM1 versus 25.1 months OS in the lapatinib cape arm with an overall response rate higher in TDM1. So this is what approved um, TDM1 for use in the metastatic setting. Um, the safety results in the graph on the right um, but in general, uh, rates of the AEs th grade three or higher um, were most common with lapatinib cape versus TDM1 at 57 versus 41 percent. And then, as we all know, TDM1 has higher rates of thrombocytopenia and increased LFTs, whereas the lapatinib cape arm had higher incidence of GI toxicity and then that palmar plantar erythrodesia that we all love. Uh, the next slide here is talking about trastuzumab drexatecan, which was our third antibody drug conjugate that was approved in breast cancer. Um, first, it was looked at in Destiny Breast 01, and this was looking at women who had received between 3 and 10 lines of therapy in the metastatic setting, which is just astounding. Um, median number of lines was 6, and so even in the patients that had been heavily pretreated, there was still a median PFS of 16.4 months. And that at that time was just crazy good numbers. I remember in December of 2019 getting that press release and I was excited and I brought it into one of my patient's rooms who had had several lines of therapy and I put it on the desk and I said, we've got something for you. This is a brand new drug that I can use. And so, um, we were able to get that patient this drug. And so I, I will always remember that, um, being so excited about a new drug. Um, so then they said, well, we know that TDXD is effective in later lines of therapy. So then how about we move it up a little bit? So then this was DB03 when they were looking at using TDXD in the second line setting. Um, so these were patients, obviously, with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer, um, and they had already progressed on a trastuzumab and and taxane. And so this study compared TDXD with TDM1. And so the efficacy results are here, where the median progression-free survival with TDXD was 28.8 months compared to 6.8 months on TDM1. And the median OS has not been reached. 
Um, and then in the safety here, the number of patients um, that had toxicities in TDXD was ILD or pneumonitis, which we'll talk about later in our case studies, but 15% of patients had ILD um, when compared to only 3% in the TDM1 arm. Um, and thankfully, there was no grade four or five events in either group. And so then the breakdown of more adverse events is in the graph on the left um, with your typical GI toxicities, your anemia, low platelets um, that we saw in both drugs. So then they said, well, TDXC works really well in later lines of therapy. We know we can now use it in earlier lines of therapy. We know that it has a cleavable linker. So then there's some bystander effect. I wonder if patients that are HER2 negative would benefit, right? And so previously, TDXC was only approved in those patients that were HER2 positive. So that immunohistochemistry three. So then they said, well, let's look at patients that traditionally we called HER2 negative. And voila, there's a new biology. It's called HER2 low. So these patients had HER2 score of one plus IHC or two plus FISH negative. There was two cohorts in um, this DBO4 study. So one cohort was hormone receptor positive patients and then the second cohort was hormone receptor negative patients. Um, they were randomized two to one, where um, some patients received TDXD and some received physician's choice chemotherapy. Um, and this also showed that TDXD resulted in significantly longer PFS and OS than the physician's choice chemotherapy. So these are the graphs of the updated efficacy that was um, reported recently. Um, and so as you can see here, those graphs are separate. So your patients that got TDXD had a me median PFS of 9.8 months compared to physician's choice chemotherapy. And then all patients also benefited with an 8.8 .8 median progression-free survival compared to 4.2 with your physician's choice chemotherapy. So um, it was overall effective, and so now we use TDXD in basically everybody. Um, overall safety summary here showed that um, I think it's really good to show that there can be dose interruptions, dose reductions, but the number of patients that discontinued is a lot lower. Um, so if your patients are having some toxicity, it's okay to dose reduce. Um, there still was 10.2% ILD and pneumonitis, so obviously a very serious complication um, that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Only 2.3% of patients had peripheral sensory neuropathy, um, and then most common that were dose-reduced side effects were because of nausea, thrombocytopenia in the TDXD arm, and then in the physician's choice chemotherapy decreased neutrophils, and then palmar plantar erythrodesia. Um, this also shows that longer TDXD exposure does not increase toxicity. So I think that's important to know is that you're not increasing the potential that they're going to have more side effects. Um, obviously, fatigue is one that happens over time and builds, but you're not at a more increased risk of having ILD if your patients are gaining benefit from the drug. Um, next, we have uh, ASCENT, which was the clinical trial that approved the second ADC in breast cancer. So sasituzumab govotecan um, was looked at on this study in triple negative patients. And so this also shows that... Um, Sasituzumab was very effective in looking at median PFS, 5.6 compared to the chemotherapy arm in 1.7 um, months. And then your overall uh, survival is also about a five-month benefit here in using sasituzumab govotecan. Um, these patients um, are all triple negative who had received at least two prior systemic therapies and at least one prior line in the metastatic setting, um, which led to the approval in 2020 for sasituzumab govotecan in triple negative breast cancer. 
So then they said, well, if it works in triple negative, can we try it in hormone receptor positive breast cancer? And so that um, is how we came with Tropic So2. So this study is looking at patients that have hormone receptor positive or two negative metastatic breast cancer. And the findings were also that in using sasituzumab, you did gain benefit. Um, in the median PFS arm, these patients gained about a month and a half benefit, 5.5 months compared to four months in uh, treatment of physician's choice. And then they did something interesting where they looked at different landmarks. So the patients, you know, like we said, got five and a half months or four months before they progressed, but then they looked at six month landmark, the 12 month landmark, and then the 18 month landmark in both PFS and OS. And those, those lines are still separate. So those patients did um, have additional benefit in the ones that didn't progress. Um, so they remained live and progression free at each landmark, which showed that there is continued benefit um, longer, longer term. Um, so this led to the February of 2023, um, the FDA approval of sasituzumab govotecan for patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Now, these patients had to have received endocrine based therapy and at least two systemic therapies in the metastatic setting. And then it's also important to know that um, you don't have to do trope 2 testing on sasituzumab in order to use it. Um, and this is the safety summary of Tropics O2. So, similar to um, TDXD, it's important to note that there were. Um, patients that had the dose delays and the dose reductions, but important in sasituzumab, only 6% had treatment discontinuation because of those side effects. So we should be able to delay um, if we need to or do dose reductions. Um, if you have a patient that um, has significant side effects much higher than what you would anticipate, um, then it's important to look into that a little bit further. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of UG UGT1A1, um, but that's testing looking at the metabolism. And I had a patient the other day who came in and she had really um, a lot of toxicity, much more than what I would anticipate. And I did UGT1A1 testing on her and found that her metabolism was much slower. So that drug stayed in her system much longer. And so I did that testing and was like, oh, we can do something about this. And so cycle two, cycle three, she tolerated much better than she did cycle one. Um, and then down here are also the AEs for um, sasituzumab. Um, so primary results, um, tropian breast 01. I will point out that I am now going to be talking about a non-FDA approved ADC um, for breast cancer. It's called DATO DXD. Um, this is Tropian 01 was looking at it in the metastatic setting. There are several studies looking at it in the neoadjuvant setting as well. Um, so Tropian Breast 01 was a randomized open label phase three study looking at DATO DXD versus investigators choice uh, chemotherapy. And those options were rubulin, capecitabine, venerelbine, or gemcitabine um, in patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive HER2 low or negative breast cancer who previously progressed um, on endocrine therapy and had received at least one systemic therapy. And so uh, early data from this study is showing that median PFS in the DATO DXD arm was 6.9 months compared to investigator's choice chemotherapy in 4.9 months. 4.5 months, sorry. Um, Tropian also showed that overall response rate with DATO um, was 50% greater than with the investigator's choice chemotherapy. Um, OS data is still not mature yet, um, but trend is favoring um, DATO DXD. Um, and so we'll just continue to watch and see if this is a drug that gets approved in breast cancer. Um, side effects here. Um, one thing that I think is very important to point out is that this drug has a different side effect profile than any of the other ADCs we've seen in breast cancer in that there's ocular toxicity. So on the graph here, it talks about 22% of patients had dry eye 
Now, I know we've seen dry eye in chemotherapy and you talk to your patients about lubricants. These are different type of toxicities. So dry eye is listed there, but there are several other um, and only and one patient in the study did discontinue due to the ocular toxicities. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, one patient uh, discontinued due to mucositis and stomatitis. Um, so when you're thinking about this drug, we talk about using oral dex mouth rinse solution um, to help prevent the stomatitis because it can be um, higher than a grade one. Um, and then also important to know is that your ILD is low. Um, it's the one at the very bottom here um, that any grade uh, was only 3%. Um, and last, uh, HER3, also not FDA approved in breast cancer, um, but this is being looked at in a clinical trial in patients that are HER2 negative because they're HER3 positive. Um, and so you can see the waterfall plot here is showing that the overall response rate for this drug is 35%. Um, so typical side effects here, potential for nausea, diarrhea, the GI, um, diarrhea vomiting, um, lowering counts. ILD here is only 1.7%. Um, so that's really good because um, I think that ILD is super serious and so something that we always want to pay attention to. Um, so it'll be interesting to see as this data um, matures a little bit more um, if this one will get approved in breast cancer. All right. I'm going to pass it over to Beth. All right, so I'm going to move over to the lung cancer space now and talk about HER2, HER3, and TROPE2 in targeting ADCs and lung cancer. Ours is a very different world than what breast cancer is, so um, I have a little bit of ADC jealousy. You have more drugs. It's all right. I'll get over it. All right, so HER2 in non-small cell lung cancer is a little bit different than what Jamie was talking about. So for us in lung cancer, HER2 is overexpressed in flight a lot. Um, however, we don't see it as a mutation as often, and that's actually where this indication is for us. Um, so HER2 is very different in that way. Like, you know, overexpression just means an overexpression of the receptors on the tumor cell. But when you see a HER2 mutation, it's actually um, an exon 20 insertion for us. So it's actually a DNA mutation as opposed to an overexpression, which makes it more of a driver in lung cancer. Um, so we're looking, um, most of our data really has been in those patients with an actual HER2 mutation, which you can see in the frequency down there is only in about 1% to 5% of patients, as opposed to we see overexpression like IHC in 15 to 30% of patients. So that's a much more common. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into the construct of TDXC again here because we've already talked about, you know, the antibody, the linker, and, and how it works. Um, so let's talk about the data here. So ours is called the destiny. I keep saying ours. It's like my patients. So, so this trial is the destiny lung O2. Um, and this is looking at trastuzumab taken in HER2 mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And this is approved. So this got its approval, um, in 2022 for patients, um, with unresectable or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer whose tumors have a HER2 mutation as detected by an FDA test, which would have to be an, a next-gen sequencing panel. This is not something that we find on IHC. And they've already um, progressed or received a prior systemic therapy. So this is in the second-line setting for us. And this was based on a randomized trial. And you can see down here that it looked at two different dosing schedules. So initially in, De in Destiny Lung 01, we looked at the 6.4 milligram per kilogram, which was a dose that had been being used, um, but it, it tended to be more toxic for our patients. And so they looked at using 5.4 milligrams per kilogram, and that was in Destiny Lung 02. And they put these two up against each other because the 6.4 milligram per kilogram, it had good response rates when they looked at it in a phase two setting. But they said, let's look at it and see if the lower dose is better tolerated. And certainly it was as well as what you can see is comparable, if not sometimes better responses. So um, you can see, I look at the, the things in parentheses because that's the percentage. So the confirmed um, response rates here were 49% for the 5.4, which is the approved dose. 
milligrams per kilogram. Um, you can see there was one complete response, um, 48 partial responses, and then um, also 44% of patients with um, stable disease. So a disease control rate, that DCR, 93% of patients didn't progress, basically, which is very good, I can tell you, for lung cancer in that second-line setting after they've already had progression on frontline treatment. Um, so we saw really good disease control here and you know, almost half of patients having um, good like partial responses. The duration of response right now is not completely reached so far, but we are seeing um, six months to, we'll see how long, um, but it's not reached yet, not evaluable totally. Um, so we're pretty excited about that data. And it, if you look at it compared to the 6.4 milligram per kilogram, it really is comparable. You can see, I always go to the DCR, the disease control rate, where we were at 93%, they were at 92% in the 6.4. So comparable, but lower dose. And as you'll see in my, in my upcoming slide here, less toxicity. So that became the approved dose. Here's the waterfall plot. If you see kind of in the middle there, and if you remember what a waterfall plot will say, that dotted line is the 30% resist criteria. So that's how you get a partial response. But any tick down on the waterfall plot means some sort of response or stable disease. Any ticks up, which I can sort of count from here as four, it looks like for four patients, um, as progressive disease. So you can see very much the majority of patients had that tick down on the waterfall plot, which, which is exciting for us. You can see the progression-free and overall survival up there. They overlap, that's great. This We weren't trialing this against something else, we were trialing against it itself, just the higher dose. So again, this just shows that the lower dose is very much comparable um, with less toxicity. So let's get to the toxicity for what we see in patients with lung cancer. So again, this is a drug that has a chemotherapy payload. So you are going to see some of those treatment-related um, and drug-related adverse effects. So um, if you look at the grade three or greater drug-related, you'll see about 38% for the patients with the 5.4 as opposed to 58% in the 6.4. So again, showing um, the better tolerability. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is the bottom. Drug-related ILD or interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis is the other term that we use here. So, you know, this has happened in other um, disease sites as well. Jamie talked about it and Liz um, will talk about it as well in colorectal. But in lung cancer, we're specific with this because they already have disease in their lungs. So really any amount of ILD can be really devastating. And I think this was, you know, one of our concerns over here on the higher doses, you know, grade two, you had a pretty high 18% rate of grade 2 ILD. Um, so we saw that this was, you know, much more tolerable from an ILD perspective over here. Now, that being said, there's still a 13% ILD rate, 12.9% ILD rate, which is higher than what we see in other solid tumors. So you have to, with the patients with lung cancer, be more specific to look out for that. It is a little bit higher, so you may see it more often, um, but not as much as the 28% that we saw over here on the higher dose. So safer, just as efficacious. So that's why the 5.4 milligrams per kilogram dose was approved. Okay, so that's the only ADC that's approved. I know this is my drug jealousy, but it's okay. We have a lot going on in lung cancer, so we're up and coming. So here's some of our studies. So we're this is the Tropion Lung 01. So again, targeting trope um, in I liked what you called it, Dato DXD. Cool name. I like it. So this is Dato DXD versus second-line docetaxel. So docetaxel is a standard of care chemotherapy in the second-line setting for patients who've progressed on frontline therapy. Um, and you will note in this one, it's with or without an actionable genomic alteration. So we're not sure here if we should exclude patients who have one of those nine biomarkers in lung cancer. You know, some they've been excluded primarily from a lot of the immunotherapy trials, but we're not sure with the ADCs. Should we really be excluding them? So you'll see some of the data say with or without these actionable genomic alterations. It's a mouthful. Biomarkers is the word I like. Um, but anyway, back to the data here. You'll see um, that the data DXD um, did show an um, improvement in progression-free survival. Again, this is not approved yet. This is still preliminary numbers coming out in this phase three trial. 
but we're hopeful that this is something, you know, that's a little bit more targetable and could show us improvement. Here's your with or without AGA. So with or without um, one of those actual uh, mutations. And so they broke it down in a non-squamous versus squamous uh, cohort. And you'll see, interestingly, that the non-squamous cohort seems to be doing better than the squamous cohort here for whatever reason. So this may be something that we do end up looking at histology as a target. Um, so more to more to come on that. Now, normally squa patients with squamous cell don't have the biomarkers. That's usually in non-squamous. So anyway, but something to look at in the future. This may be something that we may use more in the non-squamous population in lung cancer which is the majority of patients. Usually those are your patients with adenocarcinoma. Okay, um, so here's your safety summary. And again, um, you know, this has a little bit of a different side effect profile than some of our other drugs. Um, I don't know that they put the ocular toxicities here, but this is something that we are certainly seeing. Um, but you can see they don't really sp specify out here too much of what the actual toxicities are, but you can see they're definitely toxicities. So 25% um, was grade three or higher. Now that's still better than docetaxel. We know docetaxel is, a, you know, you, you, yeah, breast cancer. Yeah. So, and Liz, you've used it in GI cancers as well. So yeah, it's pretty toxic. So a little bit favorable pro toxicity profile probably versus the docetaxel. But that being said, it still is definitely having um, toxicity that we need to be aware of. I'm interested to see if ours will be any different than in the other solid tumors. I think that'll play out as we go. Oh. So there's our 20% of patients having um, the ocular events um, and 2% grade 3, 4, which means um, they probably had to uh, hold drug or dose reduce there. So, so yeah, and it's mostly dry eye, but it's a little bit more dry eye than just our average, you know, patients on uh, some of our other chemotherapies. There we have the stomatitis as well. And down at the bottom, you can see that ILD that always kind of creeps into the patients with lung cancer on study. So this is something that we are really going to have to look out for. Two grade five, two percent grade five, I know. So we're going to have to really keep our eye on on the ILD in this trial. So we will see. Okay, here's another one. So Evoke O2 in lung cancer. So now we're looking at sasetuzumab govotecan, not approved in lung cancer, and combining it with immunotherapy, pembrolizumab, because in lung cancer, that's what we do. We combine everything with immunotherapy to see if it's going to work. Um, has a lot of cohorts. There's four different cohorts here, but I'll kind of put you know, what's cohort A and B at the top um, is going to be the um, combinations of the drugs. And they're looking at it in the TPS that um, pd one expression levels of 50% or higher, which we consider the high expressors versus the low expressors. Um, you know, and we'll see how this study pans out. There's, you can see some of the data below already that cohort A is the high expressors. So typically they will do better because they we predict that they'll do better on immunotherapy. Um, so you can see if you look at the overall response rate um, of 60, 69 patients, so like trying to read, I can't see it from there, but I think it's 49 to 85% um, is definitely better than the cohort with the low PDL one, the low PDL one expression of less than 50%. So I think that's not a surprise. This is something that we're used to seeing with immunotherapy trials. Um, you can see the most common treatment-related adverse events are diarrhea, anemia, astinia. Um, but treatment discontinuation, they say low, 18%. That seems actually sort of high to me. Um, so there's definitely treatment-related adverse events here that we are going to have to watch because now you're giving an ADC and an immunotherapy. You're pretty much hitting all of them, targeted chemo, immunotherapy, all in one regimen. Um, so we'll definitely have to look out and see how this study pans out for us. And then the last study I want to talk about is Herthina. Such a name. So cool. Um, so Herthina. It sounds like it should be a Disney princess here in Orlando. Herthina. You know. Um, so Lung 01. And this is Patritumumab Derextekin, um, or HER3DXD. Did you get approval for this yet? No? Anyone on stage? No. No. I think this is one that doesn't have an approval yet. Um, but we're, we're trialing this at my institution for sure. Um, and this is for patients with EGFR-mutated non-small cell lung cancer following EGFR TKI therapy and platinum-based chemo. So after they have progressed on um, more frontline treatments for EGFR, then we're looking at giving them this drug. So this is one where it's more targeted. Our, our first one, the, um, the regular TDXD, the trastuzumab derextekin, is for the HER2 mutated. That's different that this is EGFR mutated. 
who have now progressed on frontline therapy. So this can be a tough population to treat for us um, because they're not always responsive to chemotherapy. They're rarely responsive to immunotherapy. Um, So this is a little bit, you know, something that we've had a tough time treating. So you can see response rates here, um, you know, almost 30 percent. So 29 percent, 0.8 percent. A one complete response, about 66 percent partial response. So, you know, we're oh, 20, sorry, 29 percent partial response. So I have to add up some math here. 44 percent stable disease. Disease control rate, 73 percent. Pretty good in this setting where they've had two prior front lines and they have an EGFR mutation. So they're less likely to respond to immunotherapy. So this is something that we're interested in as well. But this study also does have its toxicities. I can certainly say, oh, this is we're just giving you more data here looking at duration of response at the bottom, and there's your waterfall plot. Um, Oh, and some, oh, we got some CNS data here too. That's a cerebellum. I know, it didn't look like it at first when I looked at it, but I think there's like over there, you know, the CNS, and there's a brain met over there in the uh, left side of the brain, right side of your screen, but left side of the brain. Anyway, um, so the brain met was there, and at week six, it's not there anymore. So that's kind of interesting, you know, so we're Looking at CNS penetration here, which is important for patients with EGFR mutated lung cancer, they are more common to have brain mets. So we like to see drugs that penetrate the blood brain barrier um, in this population of patients. So we're looking at CNS uh, response as well here. Here is your side effect profile. So this is what I was getting at. Um, So red is grade one, two, blue is grade three or greater. Um, Look at that thrombocytopenia 21% of patients having um, grade three or more thrombocytopenia. Um, neutropenia is almost 20% grade 3, 4, which is an ANC of less than 1,000. Um, so we are definitely seeing um, chemotherapy-like toxicities in these patients. Um, you know, so we'll have to see how this pans out, but something that we are optimistic about in this tough-to-treat population. All right, I'm going to hand it over. Liz has been way too quiet over there. It's her turn to talk. So I'll hand it over to Liz, who specializes in GI cancers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again, everyone, for being here, whether you're here in the room and, and also virtually online. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about ADCs and GI cancer. As Beth said, when we were younger and she was five and I was eight or nine, I couldn't turn her to come to see GI cancer patients. She chose lung cancer instead, but maybe I'll make you a little excited if you don't see GI cancers right now. So I'm going to start first by discussing the Destiny Gastric 01 trial, which is TDX and used in previously treated HER2 gastric and GE junction adenocarcinomas. This was a randomized phase two study of TDX versus physician's choice, and the physician's choice of chemotherapy was either irinotehan or paclitaxel in patients with HER2 positive locally advanced or metastatic gastric and GE junction cancers that progressed on two or more prior regimens. I will add that about 15 to 20 percent of gastric and GE junction cancer tumors either are um, overamplified or overexpression of the HER2, um, HER2. So this study actually led to the FDA approval of TDX in January of 2021 for that indication of patients with locally advanced or metastatic HER2 positive gastric or GE junction adenocarcinoma receiving, who have received a prior test to ZMAB-based regimen. And that was based on the key findings. Um, overall response rate was 51.3% in the TDX arm versus 14.3% in the physician choice or the chemotherapy um, arm. Median progression pre-survival was 5.6 versus 3.5 months respectively. But over, the overall survival was longer with TDX versus the physician choice or the chemotherapy. And it's first and only HER2 targeted treatment that surpasses one year median overall survival after progression on a trastuzumab based regimen. And that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, there are safety findings or adverse events affected that occur with uh, the treatment, as my colleagues have, have discussed, and about. So 85% of patients had grade 3 or higher adverse events on the TDX arm versus the physician choice or chemotherapy arm, which was around 56%. The most common adverse events were neutrophil decrease, anemia, and decrease in the white blood count. 
And we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. 16% of pa or 16 patients, 12.8% of patients had that uh, IDL or pneumonitis occurrence. 13 were grade 1, 2, 2 were grade 3, 1 grade 4, and there were no grade 5 incidents. Whereas on the uh, physician choice or the chemotherapy arm, there was no incidence. In this study, 15% of patients discontinued treatment because of side effects. About 62% of patients required a dose delay, and we'll talk about dose delays as well. And 32% um, required a dose reduction. And that prior study was in an Asian Eastern population. So in looking at other patient categories, the Destiny Gastric O2 came out of that, looking specifically at patients in the Western part of the world. And this was a phase two single arm study of HER2 positive gastric GE junction cancers who have had progression on or after first line trastuzumab therapy. And you can see in the box, the um, overall response rate was about 41.8%, with majority being partial responses of 37%. The median overall survival was about 12.1 months, median duration response 8.1 months, and median progression-free survival 5.6 months. But again, it wasn't without toxicity. The most common grade three toxicities were anemia, nausea, decreased neutrophil count, and uh, decreased white blood count. There were um, serious drug-related events that occurred in about 10% of patients. I'm sorry, 10 patients, which was 13%. And um, there was uh, uh, one in two patients that um, unfortunately died during the course of treatment, and that was due to um, pneumonia, but not related to uh, I. I'm sorry, that were related to IDL and pneumonitis. And um, this study was a very small study, so the percentages may be increased compared to the gastric O01 study. So just switching to different um, GI diagnoses, the next two slides focus on colorectal cancer. And um, the FDA granted breakthrough designation to patients with HER2 positive metastatic colorectal cancer who have received two or more prior lines of therapy based on the Destiny Colorectal 01 and Destiny Colorectal or CRC 02 trials. And I'll talk about both of those now. This slide highlights the findings from the Destiny Colorectal 01 study, which was a phase two open label trial evaluating TDX at 6.4 milligrams per kilogram in HER2 overexpressing resectable, unresectable, or metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Their overall response rate was 45.3% with a disease control rate of 83%, duration of response of seven months, progression-free survival of 6.9 months, and median over, overall survival of 15.5 months, which is, is pretty good. And we don't think a lot probably about our colorectal cancer patients being HER2 overexpressing, but part of the genomic se sequencing give us, gives us that information so that we may have this in our toolbox to use. I think just in general with GI cancers, patients have a hard time when we talk with them about HER2 because they associate it more often with breast cancer and now maybe a little more with lung cancer, but breast cancer is, they hear us say that and they're like, are you sure you're talking to me about the right thing? And I have to go back and, and you know, review. Um, so just to conclude about this uh, colorectal, Destiny Colorectal 01, um, there was about 65% of grade 3 uh, adverse events, the most common being hematologic and gastrointestinal. 15% of patients discontinued because of uh, side effects. And... Um, this was the this in this instance there also was um, ILD associated with uh, the medication, and then because there was good results with that, they we then looked like in the lung trial, what is the the best dose? Is the best dose the six point four milligrams per kilogram, which is what we use in gastric cancer, and then that first colorectal study, or is it five point four milligrams per kilogram? to see if we have the same 
improvement in disease state, but maybe less toxicity. And this slide here summarizes that. And you can see some of the outcomes are similar with the median um, duration of response being equal about 5.5% 5.5 months, the progression free survival 5.8 versus 5.5 months. And then the adverse events were were similar that were observed in that um, they were less rather in the lower dose 49% versus 59% um, in the 5.4 milligram per kilogram versus 6.4 milligrams of what you would expect because you're using a lower dose. And um, also there was incidence of ILLD as we've mentioned a couple of times and that incidence was um, less in the patients who were treated on the 5.4 milligram per kilogram uh, dose level. All right, we're just going to finish up with a few slides um, talking about pan tumor potential for ADCs. Um, and then we're going to go into a few case studies. And then there are a lot of questions that have come in. So we will address several of those questions. Um, so, okay, the idea being here, you know, we just talked about um, using um, something like TDXD in three different solid tumors. So could this work for really any type of cancer that is her to expressing? You know, we found this in things like NTREC, which no one ever finds NTREC, I know. It's a very rare fusion, but it is indicated across tumors. Same with RET. So RET fusions now have a pan-tumor indication. Um, so what about, we're looking at that here as well. So this is a study looking at advanced solid tumors um, that are not eligible for curative therapy, which in, essentially would mean they were metastatic. Um, second line in the patient population. So, you know, they're going to progress on their frontline therapy. And then you can see a whole list of different tumor types there where it's not currently indicated, but looking at giving TDXD at that 5.4 milligram per kilogram dose. Um, and then we'll, we'll be looking at the HER2 expression. Is it a 3 plus? Is it a 2 plus? Um, we're going to look at those patients who are expressing it. Um, they are able to have had prior HER2 therapy because we know that a lot of the indications, especially in GI and breast, are in patients who had had prior HER2 therapy. So that was okay as well. So we're looking at this um, on this clinical trial. Um, you can see that um, down below 41% of the patients were IHC of 3 plus. Um, that based on the HER2 test, it looks like another 20% were 3 plus. Oh, based on centralized testing. Okay. So here's what we're starting to see. So obviously those patients with the um, IHC of 3 plus expression of HER2 are doing better. Um, they are carrying the load across the um, board there, except in pancreatic, but I don't know that there's that many patients yet. I think that's really low numbers of patients so far. So I think we'll need to accrue more there. But if you look across, especially the GYN cancers, and then you have bladder thrown in there as well, um, seems that they are definitely having responses. These are response rates, certainly better in the 3 plus, but in the 2 plus is showing um, some good response rates as well. So I think this is something, you know, again, that we've seen across other biomarkers. So this may be a biomarker that we could look at, at a, in a pan tumor effect. You can see that the toxicities, um, the all grades are the light blue, and then the navy blue there is the grade 3 or more, seem to be pretty typical of what we've seen, um, what we have presented um, in the other disease sites as well. So I don't think that anything is super surprising there. As a matter of fact, the neutropenia is almost exactly what it is in the lung cohort as well. Um, so that's um, pretty similar. If you look at the pneumonitis down there, um, it appears to be uh, a little bit less than in the lung, but maybe a little bit more than in the breast population. So any grade was 10%. Um, it looks like there was, um, you know, at least 1.1 um, that was a grade 5%, 1.1%. So um, so ILD is definitely something that's not going away, that we are going to have to manage with these patients, um, whether it's across different tumors or just in lung cancer as well. Here you have um, just looking at a swimmer's plot um, of the duration of responses for the different um, solid tumor types, um, looking across different solid tumors. They put breast in here, but I don't think breast was part of the pan tumor one. Um, I think that's just almost like your control um, and then you see colorectal, biliary tract, a whole bunch of others listed here that they're looking at TDXD and what their durations of response. I, I like that salivary gland one because I treat the salivary patients and they have a lot of HER2 expression. Um, and that's a pretty long duration there in that top hot pink one. I like that. 
so yeah, this is something um, that we can that we'll be looking at across tumors. Okay, we're gonna move on to the uh, case study portion, and then we're gonna hit some of these questions. So I'm gonna start off with um, a lung cancer case. This is a patient of mine. So she's 65 year old uh, white female, never smoker. So I will tell you that a lot of our patients with HER2 mutations in lung cancer are non-smokers. Um, she develops left-sided chest pain and cough and presents with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma subtype, the most common type we see, and the most common that might have one of these actionable biomarkers. She initially had concurrent neoadjuvant chemoradiation um, in 2020, and then she had a left upper lobectomy. So she had curative intent therapy back in 2020. She had a next generation sequencing report, which I put up there for you and um, hid all the patient identifiers, of course. And that is how it will be reported um, in a lung cancer report. It will You'll see exon 20 because it is an exon 20 um, insertion, but it's in the herb B2. So herb B is another name for her. So herb B2 exon 20, we know that this is going to be a HER2 mutation. I point this out. I wanted to include this biomarker report to show you the complexity and how confusing they can be sometimes. I would love it if they would just come out and say, HER2 mutation. Wouldn't that be nice? But we have to put all those letters, numbers, and herb B2. Um, so I don't want it to confuse. And the other thing that gets confusing in lung cancer is there's also an EGFR exon 20 insertion. So you have to know the difference there. But that's what it looks like on her um, NGS report. Unfortunately, she developed recurrence about two years later with pleural disease and multiple lung nodules. She started on first-line chemotherapy with immunotherapy for four cycles. It was complicated by some pancytopenias. And unfortunately, then four months later, she developed disease progression in the lungs. So she did not have a good response at all to our frontline chemo immunotherapy. Um, so at this point, we started her on um, trastuzumab deroxtecum because she had this HER2 mutation. And it is approved in the second-line setting post-progression. Um, and after cycle two, she developed significantly worse shortness of breath, dry cough, and hypoxia to 85% on room air. We got an urgent CT of the chest, and I have brought the images to show you. And I kept them very specific because I wanted you to see the dates. So you can see December of 2022 on the uh, left-hand side of your screen. Um, and you can see that her right lung has a ton of little dots in it. Those are all her lung nodules. That's her metastatic disease. Um, and then you can see after two cycles there in February of 2023, um, see that hazy appearance, that cloud-like hazy appearance? That's her ILD. It's pretty specific. Now, and you can see how that looks different than her disease. Her disease is all those little marble-looking things all over the place. But that ILD is very, very specific there. So what do we do? Um, and, you know, I'll bring Liz and Jamie in on this because I'm sure you may have encountered patients with ILD um, from TDXD as well. Obviously, we need to monitor our patients. In my practice, you know, we are, we are very much looking at pulse oxes at baseline. And it's really important you have a baseline so you know that if they come back and they're lower, how much lower it is than their baseline. You know, some people are living at 93%. Other people are living at 99%. So, you know, that's a good thing to know up front. Um, you are going to need to get a CAT scan of the chest to see ILD. A Some people say, oh, a chest X-ray. It would have to be really bad on a chest X-ray to get a good image of it. You really need that CAT scan. And to be truthful, if any of your patients come in with acute onset shortness of breath, I'm going to need to rule out a PE probably anyway. So you're going to end up getting that. Guys, what have you seen in presentation and workup as well for ILD? So I've been fortunate, and I have not had anyone usually present with other toxicities like diarrhea and neutropenia, but I make sure when I am seeing the patient with their family or by themselves that I'm reviewing these symptoms, and they often say, why do you keep asking me this? And I said, well, because this is a real side effect related to this treatment, so we need to monitor. Unfortunately, I have seen it, um, and so most of my patients have shortness of breath, Um and so, yes, you're ruling out your PE, you're ruling out floral effusion, you're ruling out pneumonia, yeah, D, pneumonia, yeah, yeah all of the other thing. horses, you want to find the zebra. Um, and so, yep, they're, but thankfully I have found grade one ILD. And so that's when you're seeing it on scans only and the patient's asymptomatic. Um, and so if somebody in breast cancer, if somebody has a grade one ILD, you hold the drug, you can start them on steroids. So I start them on PRED, 
0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and then you can re-challenge them. If they're grade two or higher, they're done. And so then you ramp up steroids, so one mg per kg, um, prednisone, then you have to put them on prophylaxis so they get a little bit of Bactrim, and then they get some Pepsid um, for those patients. I didn't know if yours was different than mine. No, and you know what? It, this is a really important distinction that you just made because so many of us use immunotherapy now, and it's different from immunotherapy because um, with immunotherapy, even if they have grade two, remember, Jamie said it exactly right. Grade one is radiographic findings only. They're not short of breath. Have you guys ever looked at a scan? Like, oh, my gosh. And then you walk in the room like, how are you doing? Fine. I'm like, really? And I have to go back. I'm like, did I look at the right scan? Yeah, I did. So that's... You know, you can see that sometimes like, okay, you're really not short of breath. Okay, that's grade one. M the majority of my patients are at grade two because they're they're coming in. They're like, I'm really out of breath. I'm coughing. So grade two is symptomatic. Grade one is not symptomatic. In immunotherapy, even if they're symptomatic in grade two, we can treat them with steroids and rechallenge. That is not the case for TDXD. If they are symptomatic, we do not rechallenge them no matter what. And that's typical of a lot of the targeted therapies that we use in lung cancer as well. If they are symptomatic of ILD with these more targeted therapies, it is tends to be very bad if you try to rechallenge. So that's a really important distinction to make here. So yeah, you're going to you know screen them. Though I, a lot of times for my ILD cases, I don't have to ask if they're short of breath because they're coming in because they're short of breath. Scan them with that CAT scan. Um, understand what it is. You know, is it something else? Um, suspend treatment for sure, and then start steroids a lot of the time. Um, do you always start steroids if it's grade one, or do you sometimes just hold therapy and let it ride? Mm, I typically start so that I can hopefully get them over the hump sooner so that I can look at restarting sooner, um, because otherwise then they're off drug. And so I tend to start, but lesser dose of prednisone than I would if they're grade two. Very good. Yep. So for patient education, you want to make sure that they should call you if they develop new onset of cough and shortness of breath. You'd think they would, but they don't always. They can hang out at home and be totally short of breath and not tell you. So yeah, it can't hurt to say, hey, if you can't breathe, you should call me and come in. We should look into that. Um, so and just remind them that this could be a side effect of the drug that can snowball and escalate quickly. So, you know, this is not something that just kind of marinates over time. This will happen quickly and it can be fatal. Usually if I use that word, they're like, okay, maybe I should call. So, you know, I would go, I would go there with it. ILD is a real thing. Um, so these are some of the questions you can ask. But again, for the most part, patients are going to come in and tell you that they are out of breath. Um, okay, I'm going to let Jamie take over a breast case. So I decided to um, pick a drug that's not FDA approved. Um, so that they could have the ones that were in their group. So my patient, you're, you're, you're welcome. Um, so my patient's a 53-year-old woman who was diagnosed with a screen-detected right-sided invasive ductal carcinoma. It was grade 3. Her ER was only 21 to 30. PR was negative. Her 2 was equivocal by IHC, fish ratio negative. And then she had positive axillary nodes. So her clinical stage was a T2N1. Um, her germline genetics was negative. Of note, her medical history, she had anxiety, um, and she had a history of glaucoma and was on an eye drop for some time. And then um, surgical history, she'd had a hysterectomy but retained her ovaries. So remember, Datto is not FDA approved for breast cancer, so she's on a clinical trial at my institution. Um, it's a neoadjuvant clinical trial. So with Dato, we're like, okay, ocular toxicities, let's have you upfront see ophthalmology. Um, and they said, oh, you have increased pressure in your eyes from your glaucoma. So they switched her eye drops, um, but it didn't make her ineligible for the study. Um, this was end of February of this year. So she started on study, received her first dose of Dato DXD. Um, it's given every three weeks. So she started on prophylactic eye drops. So if you want to count with me, she was already on her prior eye drops that I believe she got daily. Then we started on propylene glycol. So one drop, both eyes daily. Then she got Predforte, one drop, both eyes daily. Then she was on Rock Lantin, ophthalmic solution in her eyes. Um, and so the number of eye drops just 
And I don't know about you, but not everybody likes eye drops. So then you say, okay, now you got to do a lot of them. Sorry. Um, but she prevailed. Um, cycle three, she developed itching of her eyes and increased secretions. So we sent her back to ophthalmology and she was diagnosed with bilateral periocular inflammation. So a little bit more than just dry eye. Full disclosure, this is not my patient, but because if this is a 53 year old woman, then we've got problems. But she, um, this is exactly what her eyes looked like. She had this redness around both I mean her entire eye and then even the white part of her eye was red and this continued even after we were done with her dado dxd so this patient is now six months out from her dado and it doesn't look this bad any longer but she still has redness of her eyes um she comes to clinic and wearing a mask which is fine but then all you see is her eyes and so for her, this was a big side effect. So that's why I stress the ocular toxicity with the dado is different than any other ADC that is out there. Um, and then this is our CTCAEs. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, the common terminology criteria for AEs, but this is the one for ocular toxicities. So potential blurred vision, dry eye, keratitis, corneal ulcers, and then decreased vision. Um, so all of your grades for that as well. Okay, so um, the patient case I'm going to present is KL. He's 52, 52 years old, and he had a diagnosis of dermo, um, dermatomyositis, and his rheumatologist was evaluating him for this condition in order to pad. And unfortunately, incidentally, they found mass-like mural thickening with intense FDD, avidity in the distal esophagus and gastric cardia, and, it, and there were um, FGD avidity in the liver as well as abdominal lymphadenopathy, abdominal and retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. He had a biopsy of the liver that confirmed he had an adenocarcinoma. And he was started on treatment with systemic full FOX chemotherapy while we were waiting biomarker testing results. His biomarker testing results returned as listed here, and he was HER2 3 plus by IHC, and so trastuzumab was added once that was determined. He was not given pember pembrolizumab because of his history of the dermomyositis, and um, did well for nine months. CAT scan then showed progressive disease in the liver, and he wished to continue treatment, so we switched him to second-line therapy with TDX at 6.4 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks. He returned um, prior to cycle two, and his white blood count was 3.4. ANC was 1,100, so kind of making that cut off. Hemoglobin and platelets as listed. He had some mild nausea without vomiting, and that was controlled with Zofran. He returned for cycle three and had a significant drop in his uh, white blood count to 0.8 and an ANC of 480 platelets and uh, hemoglobin R as listed and his nausea was still unchanged. So his treatment was held because he had a grade four um, neutropenia and we talked with him and his family members about symptoms to monitor for temperatures, fever, when they need to call us if that were to be the case. And because it was so low, we felt more comfortable having that checked in one week to make sure it was kind of on the uptrend than not. And he did have labs one week later and the ANC improved to 700. So he returned two weeks later to resume his treatment and his ANC was 1800. So then we had the dilemma of what do we do? We definitely are gonna wanna dose reduce him with that ANC and do we add growth factor support? And because he had a grade four neutropenia, that's what we decided to do. And I include, we included here some of those uh, dose schedule reductions so that you have them for reference. In gastric cancer, the doses are a little bit different than breast cancer and lung cancer, so we wanted to include that. Do you guys ap approach neutropenia different in your patient population? And do you use GCSF or just dose reductions or a combination of the two? I'm a GCSF user. I mean, I have it there to use for this reason. There's not a contraindication here to using it. Um, so I would use it and have used it um, for this. Great. Same. Great. Well, the same patient had stable disease after four cycles of therapy, 
and he returned for cycle five, and this time he's reporting three to five episodes of diarrhea a day, had weight loss, and was asking what he could do for this. We eventually recommended low paramide and discussed some food recommendations. But the next uh, slide or two, just uh, things that you already know already in practice, the assessment that would be done in addition to lab values that would be checked, the sequela from um, potential dehydration related to diarrhea are listed there. And um, this goes on and uh, just readdresses how you would address some of those complications for hydration, repleting if someone's hypokalemic. We typically use low paramide in our practice. If that's not effective, then we move on to low modal, can consider probiotics. And depending on the severity of the symptoms, it's, it's not unreasonable to do a dose delay of the trastuzumab deratoxin as well. And I'm going to end with that so that we can proceed to questions. Okay, lots of questions. So let's get to some of these. Um, it's really funny because the very first two questions that came in are the same question. Um, so two different people are basically asking, are cleavable linkers in general able to hold or deliver a higher number of payload molecules versus non-cleavable linkers? And the other person is basically saying the same thing. Do we feel like they perform better due to this bystander effect? Jamie, I'm going to punt this to you a little bit because I think really breast cancer is the only place we have sort of head-to-head -head data with TDM1, which is non-cleavable, right? Mm -hmm. And TDXD, which is a, has a cleavable linker. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the you know, superiority and the data for TDXD. Do you think that translates, like in lung cancer, we don't have any head-to-head -head like that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it definitely translates. So when you have the cleavable linker, so uh, let me back up. When you have the non-cleavable linker, like in TDM1, um, you have less systemic side effects. It um, is there and goes into the cell, but you don't get that bystander effect like you do with TDXD. And so... Um, it, patients that there is more side effects when you get that bystander effect and that's why right because those other cells that are around the nucleus of the cell that you're directly targeting they get side effects or they get the bystander effect and some more side effects as well okay um uh, someone from online is asking in a setting where you are not the primary oncologist and you suspect ild would you err on the side of collaboration with the oncologist or treat for the ILD? I'm wondering if this is someone working inpatient, maybe, who isn't working directly with a primary oncologist. For me, I would say, girl, trust your gut and do it. Um, I say, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot of ILD. I think I know what it looks like. If I'm suspicious and worried, I'm not going to keep giving a drug that could be causing that if I'm suspicious. So if I'm suspicious, I'm going to get a scan. Yeah. Yeah. Because did it say? It doesn't say if it doesn't say how much it's been worked up. And maybe the person didn't even work it up. They're saying, like, am I reliant? Should I go back to the primary oncologist? And I think that it doesn't even have to be ILD. It can be anything. Yeah. You know, how much do you trust? How much are you confident in your own skills? I say, girl, you're confident. And I think if even that you go back to the primary oncologist with your plan for X, Y, and Z reasons. And I think that that's appropriate. That's a good point. Yeah. If you go back to the primary oncologist, say, I'm suspicious. This is what I'm going to do. So yeah, be confident in your skills. Um, do you consider ADC ADCs a targeted therapy or a chemotherapy? Targeted. I think they can be both. Liz, be I the tiebreaker. I was your student. <laughs> just saying. <that. laughs> I would say probably targeted, but alert them that, that the the payload is the chemotherapy. So there is a chemotherapy part of that. And it's all part of personalized medicine if we think about it that way as well. Yeah, it's definitely hitting a target. But, you know, there's a chemo component there. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be both. I don't know. Okay. Um, has anyone seen alopecia with these drugs? Yes. I can't say I have. I have a clinical trial drug that's causing it for somebody, but I don't think it's one of the ADCs. So you have. Yep. Uh -huh. Commonly, or what are your thoughts? Sasituzumab, the patients will lose their hair. TDM1, they tend not to. Um, Chastituzumab, Drexatika, and they do have hair thinning as well. Okay. Yeah, I'd say hair thinning. I haven't seen hair loss with TDX. Okay, there's a whole bunch of questions here about ILD. So, um, you know, some people are saying, is there risk factors? Can you predict that it's going to happen? Is prior radiation, prior immunotherapy something? Um, 
I'll start with this one. I looked this up before we came up here. In the Destiny Lung O2 trial, um, 73% of those patients got immunotherapy before they went on to get TDXD. So the majority of those patients had immunotherapy already on board, and you saw what the rate was. It's about 13% in the 5.4. So, and which is a little more than what the other solid tumors, but fairly comparable. So I, I don't think that we can say, oh, just because you had immunotherapy, you're at higher risk. I don't think so necessarily. The radiation question comes up for us all the time, and that's not just ADCs. It comes up for immunotherapy as well. Um, and sometimes we, we think probably the radiation puts them a little bit of a higher risk, but we have patients that have had radiation to the chest who don't get ILD all the time. So it's not a reason not to treat. You might be a little bit more on alert. But we've done clinical trials with immunotherapy post-radiation to the chest, and we don't see huge rates of ILD. So I think maybe there's a slight increased risk, but I don't think there's a significantly increased risk there. Certainly not something that I would not give them the drug based on. Any comments from you guys about predicting ILD or something that puts them at higher risk? I don't know that I have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, I tell patients that, you know, everybody is at risk if you do have a history of injury to the lung, then your risk is potentially higher. Um, those patients I'm going to scan more frequently, like every six weeks, making sure that they don't have ILD because as Beth pointed out, it's super serious and there's been deaths. And so you want to just monitor really closely. Mm -hmm. And when using steroids for ILD, do you do it similar to how you use with immune checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis? I have. I've done a long taper. It's not a short pulse. Um, Jamie, anything with your experience? No, same. I start with one milligram per kilogram of PRED, and I dose reduce by 10 milligrams per week. So, I mean, you've got an 80 kilogram person. They're going to be on prednisone for two months. Um, and then you check in with them weekly if you have the ability to have a clinical pharmacist do that call. Um, my clinical pharmacist will call my patients, see how they're doing, see how they're feeling. And then if they're not better, then they stay on that dose. They don't just taper because it's time to taper. They would stay on that dose. Um, does Do you have any reason to think the use of steroids would interfere with the efficacy of TDXD? I, I don't think so. Um, you know, we tend to think that a little bit about immune checkpoint inhibitors where you're trying to, stim you know, keep the immune system stimulated and the steroids would have an immunosuppressive effect, but I don't see that that would be the case for the ADC, so I don't think so. Um, why is the toxicity profile of the two trope 2 ADCs different if they have the same target? I don't know the answer to that one. Different payload? Do they have a different payload? I don't know. Yeah, they do. Might be the different payload. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. We need a pharmacist up here. Stat. What side effect profile for ADCs are you most concerned about? I think that depends on who you talk to up here. I mean, for me, it's ILD. But that may change when we get some of these other fancier drugs and the ocular toxicities are of major annoyance. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think ILD because deaths. I mean, you know, you can nausea. You can manage diarrhea. Very blunt. I like it. Yeah. Liz, I, I, I worry about the neutropenia, yeah. that, especially in my patients, because sometimes they are um, pre-treated, and uh, it, it, that's a bigger concern for me, and that's something that I've seen in my practice more often than the ILD. Are the adverse events associated with each of the ADCs the same, or are they different across different tumor types? Um, I, think, I think if it's the same drug across tumor types, it is mostly the same, just maybe slightly higher rates in other ones. Jamie, this one's for you. I may have missed, but the patient with the UGT1A1 detected, did you dose reduce the ADC for tolerance? I did. She went to 7.5 milligrams per kilogram. Um, the other thing that we have done in the past is, so sasituzumab's dosed 21-day cycle, days 1 and 8. I've done week on, week off when they have a UGT1A1. Along those same lines, is there a specific benefit in UGT1A1 testing in patients with significant ADC toxicity versus simply dose reducing the drug? It's a good question. It's a really easy test to do. It's just a cheek swab. Um, it's a one ohm test. So I just get the testing to know. Um, but yeah, you could always just dose reduce and see, but uh, it's additional information that I like to have. This one's for Liz. 
um, do they, and I'm thinking they mean the pathology department, usually complete her genetic testing on gastric and colorectal primary tumors, or would you have to submit a separate pathology request? So at our institution, it should be reflexive for gastric cancers, not necessarily for colorectal cancers, and that's when we would send additional NGS testing or request it within the institution. Does the DATO DXD ocular toxicity have anything to do with trope 2 expression in the eyes, or is it an off-target issue? Jamie, you probably have the most experience. (laughs) Um, I also don't know the answer to that question um, because it's just been on clinical trial at this point. Um, I'm not sure. Would you wait till the patient has completely tapered off the steroids um, before considering a rechallenge with the ADC? No, I want them at least at 20, though. Okay. Does ILD risk increase in the lung cohort due to bystander effect? Any data on this? That's another really good question, and we think that that's why there's higher rates of ILD in patients with immune checkpoint inhibitors because it's a bystander effect, not necessarily in, in, in immune checkpoint inhibitors. We think that's a, um, you know, just a local membrane effect, but kind of the same idea with ADCs is that there would be this bystander effect. I think that's possible. I don't think we have any way of necessarily proving it other than to say that we see slightly higher rates in the tumor that's native to the lung um, for those patients, so... Okay, I think that's it because we're in our last minute of time here. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash BUC 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated. This activity is certified by PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.